Broadcasting live from Boys Who Keep Secrets Don't Get Custom for Dessert. This is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Garrett Strother. And I'm one of your other hosts, Seamus Connolly. And our third host is Mike Myers, <laughs> so I guess but so. he's not going to talk right now. Oh, uh, it's just the, the music in the background, folks. That's all we got here. But before... We are, we are talking about the brand new, today as of recording, the brand new Halloween Ends. Before we get into that, I think we should jump into some news. I agree. And there there's three big old blows right up top. First off, a rest in peace to the legendary, somehow still alive after an absolutely prolific career in her 90s, Angela Lansbury has passed away. I don't even know where to start with her filmography, her Broadway history. I mean, this is Love It and Sweeney Todd. Mm. That's pretty hard to top, but I mean, probably most iconic now for Mrs. Potts and Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I I feel like that's where I... And she was also in Anastasia, which is the the long-lost princess movie, I think. Uh, That movie is awesome. A murder she wrote? Yes, that's, I, that's I think her I other big never, thing. I never get my toes into that, but I know that's like the longest running thing. It's Columbo, but she's all late. Yeah, sure, so, sure, I'll, I'll do it then. Of course, also the Manchurian Candidate, among other film classics. Mm. A really big loss. I understand that we can look forward to seeing her play herself in what is her last role in Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery coming this November, so... Pretty oh excited God. about that. Yeah, game. that'll be very interesting. I, I'm super excited for Glass Onion, and especially now that this is going to be kind of the, the capsule of her last, her, the, the period on the sentence of her her long, very long career. So that'll be very interesting. And another person who we posthumously talked about on this show recently, also playing themselves in Glass Onion. I'm not going to share who she is to. Preserve the surprise. Oh, the theater, I have no idea. That'll be interesting. We'll talk about that coming up pretty soon on the show, about a month away. So I'm pretty excited to jump into that. We'll circle back, actually, to Glass Onion here in a few minutes. But next up on the docket, Robbie Coltrane, best known for his role in Harry Potter as Hagrid, the beating heart of that entire film series, as far as I'm concerned has also passed away at age 72. Yeah, that is, that's pretty, I, I feel like I really don't know Robbie Coltrane from anything else besides Harry Potter, but he was such an incredible part of that franchise. Probably some of the sweetest moments in the entire franchise come from that character, and it's it's pretty sad to see him go like that, but I I do know a lot of people have been reposting and screen capping and finding the footage of during the Harry Potter reunion special. He had this really sweet speech about like what the character means to him and how he feels like his legacy as that character is going to continue long after he's passed. And that's I mean he's an, obviously a fan favorite, one of the best sweetest characters in that franchise, and he, he I think is very right that people are going to remember him for the sweet gentle giants of Hagrid in those movies. He's also one of the best parts of the Pierce Brosnan Bond film. Yes! A couple oh of my those. god, how could I ever forget that? That is absolutely true. More embarrassingly for you, Seamus, you forgot that he's Daphne's brother on Frasier. Wow. You know what? Didn't know that until this very moment. It wasn't even forgetting it. I watched those episodes recently, Garrett. <laughs> the brothers were there for the wedding. I can't believe it. He's so funny in those ones, too. He's got the boom hour voice <laughs> where you can't understand a single thing he's saying. That is so funny that I didn't realize that, but it's got to be the beard. It's got to be the beard and the long hair that I'm used to him having in the Harry Potter movies that I just, that completely went over my head. He disappears in that role. He really does. And... It's also a testament to, I think, the special effects and the body doubling mm-hmm. and all of the, the wizardry, if you'll excuse the term, <laughs> that goes into creating Hagrid Gandalf style. Oh, yeah. That really sells that with, obviously, his performance really shining through all of that giant bush of black beard yes. and hair. And the third person who has passed away... Uh, another fan favorite, but in a very different context, is... 
beloved Milwaukee mm. musician and subject of the documentary American Movie, Mike Shank, has passed away. I'm kind of surprised at how big the outpouring of support yeah. from, you know, really well-known artists who are coming out to talk about how important not only that film is to them, but how Mike Shank's optimism and dry humor, even if it's not always intentional, and kindness have really impacted them. I've seen a lot of comments online to the effect of watch American movie and learn how to be a good friend from Mike Shank. Yeah, honestly, that that is really kind of the way I view it, too. I, I will say Mark Borcher, the real main subject of American movie, he is... You know, an incredibly endearing and strange and interesting character. But a lot of the time, he's very heavy-handed in in how he's going about the production of his film. The way that you kind of grow to know him alongside of his his boy, Mike Shank. Mike is just such a nice man. He's so sweet. He's always up for things. He's just trying to have a couple beers and hang out with his boy. Maybe make make a couple frames on the camera. Truly a sweet, sweet man, and I, I'm very sad that he passed so young. He was only 52, I think, and yeah, he will be, obviously, as you said, the outpour is incredible for this seemingly very unfamous, you know, famous person in this movie, but I, I will very much remember my Shank for the rest of my days. Even, you know, it's been many years since I've probably seen an American movie, but he is an incredibly memorable part of that movie. I think about him screaming down in Mitchell <laughs> in ninety one yes. constantly. Oh, oh, it's it we 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 learned in the history halls of Mike Shank, man. My god. But oh, well that Blu-ray is coming out soon. So We are gonna watch that. Though moving on to more entertainment news, Paramount is developing a new naked gun film with Lonely Island's Akiva Schaefer directing and Liam Neeson in talks to Star, who has a comically similar name to Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> Is that what they're going for? <laughs> so, That's so funny. Um, oh my god. It should maybe be John Hamm. I know he just did Fletch and she and he shouldn't get to inherit all of the chic <laughs> franchises, but... I don't know. I think Liam Neeson has this weird later in his career branch towards comedy a little bit that I, I think would be interesting to see him go for considering... Leslie Nielsen in those originals is, like, the weirdest kind of straight man in the most cartoon world of all time. I'm also a huge fan of Akiva Shaver's previous work, uh, Hot Rod. That is one of the goofiest, funniest... It's truly one of my favorite movies of that era. I... Best movie of 2007. I'm going to say it right here. I don't know what else came out that year. I don't know what else came out that year. Atonement, maybe? I don't know. Uh, You can't beat... You can't beat a man trying to save his dying stepfather to fist fight him. <laughs> That's incredible. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that tone is very similar, the way they just kind of piled on joke after joke with that. And I don't know. I'm, I, I would I will definitely see this. I'm a big naked gun guy. Bill Hader better be in this movie, right? Was there any reason why he wouldn't be? I feel like it's got to be. Uh, what do you think the over-under is? On O.J. Simpson jokes. And I know that's a little bit touchy since he's walking around Hollywood now. Do you... All right. <laughs> Do you think he could be in it? Is that an insane that's thing too to far. say? That's is that not even You know what funny? I think they could do? I think they could do... <laughs> Did you see Space Jam A New Legacy? No, I didn't see Space Jam A New Legacy. Spoilers for Space Jam A New Legacy. Um, other than Rick and Morty showing up. One of the other things that happens is they're like, Guys... It's halftime. We're getting our, our butts whooped. We need our secret weapon, Michael Jordan. Oh. <laughs> and they go out, it's and it's the big, long walk <laughs> silhouetted in the hallway, and it's Michael B. Jordan. So, what is the parallel Daniel to Daniel okay. Kaluuya, maybe? I don't know. I guess that would, <laughs> that would be such a stretch that I would kind of be very in for, but... My, they, they have to at least make a joke. Maybe no, they don't. He that's, murdered people. That's, that's, that's allegedly. Uh, allegedly he, we don't want to get sued. I guess. Don't be. OJ Simpson suing this podcast is the best thing that ever happened to us. <laughs> I always said that. There's no way. There's no way to top that. I just <laughs> that joke. So 
so I'm just going to move us on. <laughs> and our last bit of news is that Glass Onion, the Knives Out sequel that's coming out this November, will be in major theater chains for one week starting November 23rd, followed by its premiere on Netflix streaming where it will remain exclusively. I don't know what the word is on, like, art house theaters continuing to carry it or anything like that, because I know there's certain rules with Academy Awards eligibility and theatrical releases, and I don't know if that's helping play into the strategy at all, because it's not like the original Knives Out won a ton of Oscars or anything, but Netflix is going for their Oscars, and this isn't going to win Best Picture or any acting awards or anything, but it could very easily win production design, costume design, things of that nature, more technical awards. Well, I mean, this makes me happy that we will get the chance to see it in theaters at the very least. Like, as as, as just, a, just a viewer, just a fan of the first one, I'm, I'm pretty happy that, I mean, I would have very happily watched it on Netflix too, but this, this gives it a little bit more of a chance to be that more spectacle that, I, that I'm, I'm looking forward to in this weird Benoit Blanc franchise now. I hate that I'm going to say this because this is the opposite of what I want studios to take away from this. Okay. It's kind of exciting that I'm going to go see it in the theater, and then when I saw the original Knives Out in the theater, I think I saw it twice. I might have seen it three times, but I think I just saw it the twice. I think I saw it with you, <clears> and I think I saw it then with my family later. That was a movie that I very highly anticipated releasing on home media so I could watch it again because I was so excited to watch it again because it was a mystery and it was really entertaining and I wanted to find all of the little threads and clues and the idea that we're going to go watch it in the theater <laughs> and then a week later I can watch it as many times uh, as I want. That's got to, it does feel pretty nice, especially because I, I have big expectations for Glass Onion, truly, and I think, you know, if it pulls it off, I'd be happy to watch it a, a week later again, probably with you on your couch right here. But, but uh, let me be clear, this is bad for cinema right, right. and for all the stuff. Of course. I am a stupid little boy and I do like the instant gratification. As, as so. the consumer, as the consumer, you are consuming appropriately for the <laughs> overlord. So I think everything's going off great. Uh, because the best thing we could do is not watch it on Netflix. But we're True. Just, uh, it's going to be... Funny though, Garrett. It's gonna be fun. There's gonna be a mystery involved. I'm, 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 I'm Catherine Hahn is there. Yeah, come on. All right. Well, speaking of mysteries and murder, more murder than mystery, really. Yeah, but it's, well, <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. Just a little bit. Mystery is maybe the viewer again. I don't know. <laughs> I think I think it's time. Uh, e- evil evil ends tonight. I'm trying to find something to say that's not technically a spoiler, but I think we should talk about Halloween ends. Halloween <laughs> ends right now. Today's main segment is the brand spanking new Peacock original. Do I call it it's that? It's not original. It's, it's streaming day Streaming day. on Peacock. Halloween ends. The perhaps last Halloween in a while, maybe, the the final in this new line trilogy at the very least. It's the question mark at the end ending. Yes, really yes. Is what it is, I think. Without getting into spoilers at all, and I don't think that's really a spoiler. No. Because it, every it, Halloween movie is that, though. Yes, isn't it? We'll talk about how much this follows that trend in spoilers, but that's the nature of these slasher franchises. They're perennial. Regardless of how finally or not finally Halloween does end in this film in 15 years there will be another Halloween movie oh yes most certainly there will be but as for the newest in this Halloween franchise that kind of branched off in the Halloween 2018 sector of this we could talk all day about how insane each different little tether of this franchise can get to but unspoilery thoughts all together i had a fun time watching it with you gary we made sure that we watched it together this time it is probably gonna be one of the least revisited Maybe more revisited than Halloween Kills. I mean, I definitely, would definitely more watch yeah. this again. I don't think either of us have fully processed how weird the movie we just watched was. Oh, it was incredibly bizarre. No, I mean, I will acknowledge that all day. It's almost like when I saw The Rise of Skywalker, and I was just like, well, this is the end, so, like, I'm kind of fine with everything. <laughs> like, you can't get too weird with how this finale goes. It as got long as weird. 
weird. It's pretty damn weird. And if I was just like, oh, this is just going to string off into a million more sequels, I would have been a lot less okay with it. But because it feels like this is kind of how they intended to do their, from 2018 to now, this new timeline, I think I very much enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much as an experience that you and I had, yes, yes. and the conceit of the overall film, I'm not going to go as far as to say it's clever, but it's entertaining and fun, and it's not something I've really seen before yes. in this kind of film. However, as the end cap to the quadrilogy that they've been yeah. building here, I don't think it makes very much sense. <laughs> I don't think it's Tonally, I think it feels almost nothing like the previous two Halloween movies, which don't particularly feel that similar to each other, and certainly don't feel that similar to the original Halloween. Oh, absolutely not. No no chance. We talk all the time about how tired we are of experiencing the epic conclusion. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So, I'm not even that mad at Halloween, a franchise whose sequels I have never cared about, and probably never will care about. Having this kind of weird fizzle tangent offshoot of an ending that is also trying to give you the pleasures of the larger finale. Again, without getting into spoilers. Right. I think this is my favorite of the new ones. Because you rewatched 2018, Halloween 2018, more recently than I I watched have. it this week, yeah. But it's Pretty fun, man. I don't know. Like, it's Halloween ends almost feels a little more self-aware than they've ever been. They're just kind of going for it, you know. And maybe yeah. there is stuff. I was kind of speculating about this while we were watching. Maybe there is stuff from insane sequels down the line that we've never watched that do somehow tie back in. There's a few hyper-specific things that Michael Myers can kind of do that <laughs> I have never seen in any version of his character. But and neither of us have seen, and I looked this up, by the way, after we watched the movie to confirm that we were right <laughs> about it. Neither of us have seen Season of the Witch, but the blue italic font that they're using is the Season of the Witch is it? font. Oh, hell yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I'm glad Season of the Witch got a nod. Something. And who knows if there's more that we don't even know about, but... This definitely feels like a weird 90s climax <laughs> yeah, to people yeah. and not the conclusion in 2022 to this franchise that they've been building. Because frankly, did you think this movie was scary at, at all? Oh, absolutely not. Horror movies aren't all about jump scares, but there was like one and it was not scary. You know, we were making fun of a lot of the main character choices, as you do in mm -hmm. watching a horror movie. Probably the least scary, even probably less scary than Halloween Kills. Because Kills, we can get into the tone of each of them, I think. Yeah. The first one, it's Halloween, it's mm. unimpeachable. Are there flaws? Yeah. But that just makes it better. It's the fingerprints on the claymation. Yeah. You know, you can see the craft that's going into this really small budget, mm. really smartly, craftily made horror film. Halloween 2018, classic <laughs> reboot syndrome movie. It has... A very dark tone. It's very self-serious. It's about trauma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's introducing the new reboot characters, hyper-violence, but it's also very grounded. Again, it's that green mm -hmm. reboot scenario, legacy reboot scenario. Halloween Kills goes full camp, but not in a fun way. It just goes like, the gore is really strong, yeah. and they're trying to come up with kills for Michael to do that are really gross and over the top and don't feel rooted in his character from Halloween 2018 or Halloween 1978. Mm. It doubles down on the gore and the scares in a way that is disturbing but isn't necessarily scarier or more compelling. And then this movie kind of forgot it was a slasher movie, I think. I was going to say, the, there's there's a couple really gnarly pieces of violence that we were both looking at each other like, this is insane, but... For the most part, it was fairly tame for a Halloween movie in terms of, like, the blood and guts of it all, you know? I, I was I was a little surprised at that. I guess I wasn't necessarily missing it. I mean, compared to how it was in Halloween Kills, I mean, who like, needs that? This, I felt like they could have gone a little farther in the gore category. There were moments I do think that they're trying to acknowledge that they felt like Halloween Kills was a little bit too far in that direction. Oh, yeah? We'll talk about that. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wish there was more here, because it's not particularly compelling as a piece of character work. Specifically, Lori feels 
inconsistent. Oh yeah, too inconsistent from the way she's been previously written in these last two films. Jamie Lee Curtis is doing what she can. She's always good in these. I just don't think it feels like the Lori that was in 2018 or Halloween Kills. It is not as simple as picking up directly where we left off with of the other course. movies, but you're not wrong. Even with the time that we take between the movies, it does not feel consistent with what we're, we got with Lori. And I guess even less with her granddaughter. Allison. Yeah, I Allison mean, feels like a completely different character. At this point, I could barely care about Allison, but I mean, but, like... It's more justified in universe because she's so young and yeah, she's been true. through arguably more trauma. <laughs> <laughs> well, they really hit oh, home on that with this one. Then Lori has. So I think the trauma talk was a lot less condescending in this, though. Sure. Again, that's something we'll circle back to in spoilers. Yeah, overall, character work isn't really compelling for me. Slasher work isn't really compelling for me. It's the tone sure, that's really yeah. carrying this movie. I, I think I agree with you on that. There's... A lot of fun stuff, a lot of great set pieces that worked for me in ways that I was incredibly not expecting for them to even come through at all, let alone for them to come through with me internally with being a viewer on this, but I thought it was very fun. They didn't mess around with so many side characters in Haddonfield like they did in the other movies. Wait, it's because they killed them all in Halloween. Aye, Hills, that's true, that's true. But this one, it felt a lot more, you know, a story that is working within the story, not just, like, adding. It's like, oh, yeah, I was Michael Myers' neighbor 40 years ago, and I'm going out to find him. There is Lindsay, who's in this movie, oh, yeah. just the little girl that Lori's friend is babysitting. Not even the yeah. kid that Lori's babysitting, the kid that Lori's friend is babysitting, who just is, and I know she was in Halloween Kills, but she's just in this movie. Yeah. We're just expected to know who she is. <laughs> I mean, we kind of picked up on it. Early enough, but we did have to Google it a little bit. Especially with how flashback heavy this is. Oh, this yeah. is a new thing for the Halloween franchise. A lot of new things for this For the final timeline. So let's get into the official spoiler warning for Halloween Ends. I think we should talk about the thing that was surprisingly working for us. Michael Jr., baby. Michael Jr., Corey. Corey was kind of great. Am yeah, I crazy? Like, I... It's not like a real great. No, no, no. In like the device of how this same slasher story can get evolved mm -hmm. for four years after Halloween Kills, it was kind of pissing me off a little bit how many people in the town were just like, yep, Lori's as bad as Michael, but like... Or is the or problem is, is inherently... responsible for Michael's murders? It was an interesting way to see, like, in this small community, if there's any fatal or injury accident with a babysitter in any way, they're pinned for it now, and they're going to have their lives ruined. Mm -hmm. Almost almost to, like, a like a Freddy Krueger degree of, like, the town's banding together and deciding that you're trash, so you're going to be driven to commit these horrible things. His slow turn to Michael, I guess, is he possessed? Well, Are we that's, talk that's about that? the discussion, right? That's the discussion. Now, first of all, I do want to really quick touch on the whole town turning on Lori. Because that's the scene where I feel like they talk about Halloween Kills a little bit. Mm. Because the woman who gets the light bulbs through her yes. throat, oh. whose husband gets the billion kitchen knives in him in Halloween Kills. Again, that movie's just so over the top. It's insane. insane. In that scene, her... Her sister, I think it is, is yelling at Lori, like, look at what Michael Myers did to my sister. Look at how deranged this is. Right, but yeah. You drove a madman to this. And I don't agree with her point, obviously, but it does feel like the movie kind of being like, hey, we know how bad Halloween Kills' gore was. So we're going <laughs> to yeah, acknowledge yeah. it a little bit here. But yeah, Corey starts the movie as a sympathetic, normal character who ends up in a really bad situation in a kind of Scream-esque opening mm. twist. No Michael at the beginning of the movie at all. No Michael for like a half an hour. I, the, the I movie. think it's almost an hour. It's kind of crazy. Hour. He gets beat up by those stupid band geeks twice. Like twice before he before, needs, before, yeah. before we get a glimpse of Michael <laughs> Myers. Unless there's stuff that we didn't... Oh, yeah, in the background, the shape yeah. is behind a bush or something. Mm -hmm. That's the best part of the Halloween movie, oh, yeah. right? That's the tension that we didn't get in this one. I don't think... There was no stalking. There was either just the Corey sequences and the killings. 
and that was kind of it. We got one scene that was a very direct homage to him being behind the bush looking out of yeah, the definitely. window and everything. But Corey, he accidentally ends up causing the death of the kid that he's babysitting right. by kicking a door open that the kid is standing behind and the kid falls down. There's this from uh, Dumanji. In the yeah, front that's very Dumanji. Like, what, what is this? Especially in the Haddonfield. <laughs> yeah. Those southwest suburbs, uh, guys. Seamus, let me tell you. Don't know how to live, man. I get, they've got to go get murdered by Bill Shatner mask people now. <laughs> I don't know what to say. He strikes up this relationship <laughs> with Allison, Lori's granddaughter. The whole town is turned against him for being the psycho child murderer. <clears throat> Obviously, Lori and her family have also been isolated by the town. Really, very little talk about Judy Greer dying, even though that's the big twist oh, yeah. ending of Halloween Kills. They, like, like show her picture. And, like, Lori's, like, looking at her, I mean, kind of. Lori puts their wedding rings on the yeah, chain yes, for the girl to wear. But I thought the ending was going to be more about, like, yeah, yeah totally. my mom would have wanted me to reconnect with you, Grandma, or something like that, but not really. They have their little... Direct to Wong Kar Wai fallen <laughs> angels in the back of the motorcycle. Where actually, that's a little bit after they initially fall in love. That's after he. We'll talk about the Michael thing. Where I, for a split second, thought Michael Myers was hugging Corey <laughs> as they rode down the highway on the back of the oh, motorcycle. That would be a beautiful sight to see. God, I love it. But essentially, Corey, through a series of misadventures, uh, <laughs> that's what you want to call him, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Ends up in the den of Michael Myers, who's been living like Pennywise in the sewers. That's really what it is. Uh, Haddonfield. For four years. And for four full years. The homeless guy indicates that Michael is eating people because. Does he? All these people go into that dungeon and they never come out. It's like, what makes you special? I'm Michael Myers, give me the mask. He's a fucking weirdo. It feels very much like the crazy Loomis guy who wants to put on the mask in 2018. Again, this movie's re-hitting beats that this trilogy of sequels has already hit. It also feels like to me, I thought a lot during this movie, not that this would make a better sequel to 2018 than Halloween Kills did, because they're all incongruous together, but why didn't they just do a trilogy? Because they clearly didn't have a trilogy in mind. Why not just do a solid, like, Halloween 78... Halloween 2018, Halloween Ends. Or Halloween Kills or Halloween Returns or something could have been 2018 instead of just Halloween. Halloween. Yeah, I, I agree with that. They, I think it was kind of meandering all in all, the, all three of them together there, but it, it, was, it was like a fine landing, yeah. I would say. I, I enjoyed it. Kills is still a filler episode that leads to nothing. It yeah. sets up nothing. Oh, what a bummer of a movie. I would never watch that again, I don't think. I do. I did rewatch this week the first 20 minutes. That's the 1978 flashback. Oh, sure, that, yeah. That's pretty good. I think that's pretty great. As we were leading up to Michael Myers in his first real image, we can see him, and we briefly see him walking towards the unconscious body oh, yeah. of Corey earlier, but... He grabs Corey by the throat, and there, there's a That's So Raven push into oh Michael's God. eye, where he psychically seems to sense all of the misfortune that has befallen Corey. And I don't know if Michael Myers feels sympathy for him. I don't know if he possesses him. But from that moment on, Corey is the disciple of Michael Myers. Also, if this were the 90s, we would have gotten the rad... Halloween colon, the disciple of Michael oh, Myers tagline. God, really he it is such a fun they push in on his pupils and then he sees his own reflection in Corey's eyes. Which kind of pays off the ending of Halloween Kills. I right. must say that. Sure, sure. We learn that he used to Jim Cummings' cop from the beginning of Halloween Kills talks about how when Michael was a boy, he always used to stare out his sister's bedroom window and everybody assumes that he was staring out at Haddonfield, the town that he would later destroy when the ending of that movie, After He Kills Judy Greer, reveals that he's staring at his own reflection. So, seeing his own reflection in Corey's eyes, that's the sympathy thing that I'm kind sure, of yeah. seeing. Even though, I don't know if we know enough in this timeline about Michael being abused or anything like that for it to make sense that he would sympathize yeah. with Corey's home life and his awful mother and the fact that boys who keep secrets don't, don't get, get custody. 
Just the, the dessert? Yeah, of course not. That's as tragic as they kill him. My god. I guess I took all of that to mean... I don't know what I take it to mean, if I'm being honest. It's so strange, dude. It's so weird. I almost want it to mean that it's that's Corey's own reflection of his life, seeing what he could become in Michael, being like, well, this is what happened to this man who was abandoned by his family and turned on by his community, and he is now a legend and an undying thing that nobody can ever possibly forget, and that's him kind of opening himself up to that idea, but really it seems like he's borderline possessing him like a demon or ghost and controlling him in a way that it's like an evil corruption. I guess they keep talking about the different forms of evil, but it's it seems like a little bit of a cop-out to just be like, well, this guy's just, he just he's doing it, he's there. Mm -hmm. And not only is he there, but he's like commanding Michael to do things, he's like combating him physically in certain parts. It's kind of crazy. That's the weird part. I thought we were going to get a kind of Renfield Dracula mm, situation sure. where he was going to be this meek, mad servant. Yes, like, I, I want to live up to you, but he's already like, well, I'm already there, so mm -hmm. I can rip the mask off but, my face. But also, he's not, because we see that he doesn't have the same vulnerability that Michael does, although Michael's pretty haggard when we, when we meet him in this movie, and it's clear that hiding away for four years has weakened him. Yeah. But at the same time, I actually love the moment where he kills Allison's awful ex-boyfriend cop oh, guy. yeah, yeah. And you see the strength return to Michael. He just needs the kill, or whatever, I, I guess. Because that retroactively makes me see Michael in a very different way. Mm. And actually... A big problem I had with Halloween 2018, rewatching it, was it seemed like Michael just killed for the sake of killing. He killed indiscriminately. That entire psychosexual mm -hmm. motivation from 78 was just gone, except for in a couple of scenes. Yeah. Here, I'm like, okay, if Michael has been in prison for, you know, 40 years, mm -hmm. then if he needs the kill back to get the power back, then that kind of tracks. Yeah. Although, I don't think that actually works as an explanation for 2018, because we see him enacting superhuman feats before he's actually killed again. They're not doing too much work in this movie to explain it. No, I mean, I'll take, it, I'll take it as, like, maybe that's his personal, like, his spirits are being lifted, I guess. Like, that could just very well be his own personal therapy of, like, all right, I'm myself again. I can go cut some heads off. I like that it's not super explained. I like that it could be yeah. supernatural. I like that it could be psychological. I like that he is a little bit more human, but then at the same time, immediately more monstrous. Yeah. He's and literally that's living in the sewers. <laughs> the best Michael stuff in this movie, oh, yeah. because then he disappears for most of the rest of the movie. That's my big issue with this as a finale to the Halloween franchise. Sure. And that's why I like it more as an exercise in, like, just a stupid, campy horror slasher film for a movie that's about the end of Michael Myers. There's not a lot on Michael Myers. It's really not, and that's an interesting route. We're, we're, I still think that the stuff with Corey was very interesting and well done, but it, even in half of the scenes that Corey and him are together on screen, he's just, like, taking control. He's the one in charge. Mm -hmm. For a while, I was like, oh, is this Michael fully transferring to the strongest that's what I thought vessel? Well. But... He just kind of gets his ass kicked later on and his mask taken. and It's crazy how easily Corey overpowers yeah. him because Michael Myers is a superhero. Michael Myers is an unstoppable force. He is the shape. And Corey, again, is human. If they had done more to establish this idea that Corey could do anything superhuman, which we don't see him really do a single thing other than overtake Michael Myers. There, there's, like, one part where he, like, is directly behind Laurie all of a sudden after he does the Bush stuff, but, like, that's just also kind of just being sneaky or whatever. And I think it feels more like that's Laurie's state of paranoia. Sure, yeah. Because at that point, the movie hasn't explicitly told us that he's gone full disciple. We're not sure mm. that Corey's going to be good or bad after his initial interaction with Michael. The movie very briefly doesn't want us to trust Lori because she knows immediately that mm. there's evil in him. Yeah. And that's also one of the more interesting parts of this film for me is 
that Lori gets so much of that vindication mm-hmm. in this and being right, and they contrive this romance oh, yes. with Allison to make her turn on Lori because the movie knows there's no other way to get Allison to turn on Lori. It's insane. As we were watching, we were just like, this makes no sense. This makes no sense. They fight like they've been dating for months when they literally met yesterday. Yeah. But at the same time, you and I were discussing during the grown-up birthday scene (laughs) in the diner where all the cops are having their gift bags and their balloons and their sponge cake and they're all out. (laughs) None of their wives are there. None of their kids are, having, are there. They're all having one Budweiser apiece, and that's it. Label the camera. <laughs> yeah, label the yeah. camera. During that scene where Corey and Allison are talking about their trauma, <laughs> I actually felt like this is the most compelling work where they're talking about trauma in any of these last two films because it's not trying to be like generational trauma. Isn't that sure, so hard? Sure. It isn't horror scary because it's traumatic. It's saying, okay, here are some people that feel alienated because of the awful things that they've gone through, and the intensity of the events of their lives leading up to their meeting mm-hmm. means that they view life in a different way than normal people view life. So it makes sense that their intensity would be attractive to each other, and that there is a capacity in one another for understanding that they don't have with a normal person. You know, that all works. It's not, like, super psychologically sound, necessarily, but for a movie like this, where a guy gets maybe possessed by Michael (laughs) Myers, I'm good with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rushed in a way that we were really calling out as it was happening, but if we kind of give it that suspension of disbelief, we kind of elongate it in our own minds, it kind of makes that amount of sense. It's rushed, and then it spends enough time on it that it retroactively feels a little bit better. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It still doesn't feel like enough to make Allison turn on Lori, and I wish there was any kind of implication in that maybe Allison was under some kind of influence. Not that Michael's oh, ever had vampire yeah. powers before like that. But it could also make sense. Could you imagine Lori turning to Allison and seeing the Michael eyes? Rather anticlimactically, when we get to the end of the film, it's really easy, ultimately, to dispatch Corey. I mean, Lori briefly looks like she's killed an sure, sure. man. Sure, And the whole argument is, maybe look at the Michael Myers <laughs> mask sitting right next to the guy. Listen to him for a second. It's, what day is it today? October 31st? Things are happening? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. in Haddonfield, Illinois? Oh, God. Weird. Then they're like, oh, wait, we have to do the Michael thing, I guess. Right, we have to wrap, wait, we said we were going to wrap up this thing. It feels like they had a spec script for a different slasher. <laughs> yeah, they and were, they were like, like, let's make it a Halloween in. Yeah. And who knows, that's maybe what it could have been. I mean, Danny McBride, I knew, was in the writing, right, but yes. we also noted at the beginning there are four writers on this, I think. Yeah, something like that. So who knows how they all fit together. How did you feel if this is the death of Michael Myers, the real death, the one that actually sticks, unlike Halloween 2 <laughs> and probably additional Halloween movies? Oh, so Michael many, Myers I'm sure. Is. I thought the destruction of his body was is satisfying in a way where I'm like, oh, finally, they're doing what it takes to stop this thing. I think any other way they could have dispatched him finally would have not been. I would have been like, well, he's coming back later, I guess, but this feels, if not entirely satisfying in the way that they had the showdown, I'm satisfied in the way that they conclusively said there is no physical possible way proper Michael Myers is going to pick himself up out of the pieces of this metal shredder machine and come after Lori. Again. Like the T-1000? Exactly. Back exactly. Together. Especially watching it, like the weird pieces of his bones just crunching on it's himself. It's really effective. It's pretty gnarly, but I feel like evil ended tonight. You know yes. what I mean? I, I think it works. Evil definitely didn't die. It changed shape. Uh, which we'll talk oh, about in yes, one second. Yes, we'll talk yes. about that in one second. I agree with you that everything that happens after his initial death, quote unquote, parading him through the town and putting yes. him in the shredder that you yes. called like two minutes into this movie, <laughs> they somebody was doing that. I, would, I didn't think it was going to be him, if I'm being honest. But we should have. We should because we knew he will die. Exactly. I wish that the actual sequence of Laurie's showdown with Michael had built to a more definitive conclusion, a more definitive climax. I'm thinking about the scene in Speed where, you know, there's the big fight, and then I'm not going to say character names, but there's the big fight, and then all of a sudden one guy's head's just off. Yes. 
if there had been, like, surprise decapitation <laughs> in the Michael Myers fight. I feel like I trust the decapitation enough as a temporary... Oh, sure. Although they imply maybe in the sequence where Lori pins him to her island in her kitchen right. and slowly bloodlets him and then Allison finishes the job... They imply that maybe the blood is the source of Michael's power in some capacity. Yes, but also, he's been shot and stabbed in major arteries in every single movie he's been in, so I don't know. But I wish that there had been a more thrilling conclusion to that fight. I agree. Even if I do think that the actual emotional denouement to the Michael Myers sequence was satisfying. Yeah, I can agree with that, I think. I still like the knife through the palm and him ripping his hand in two, sure, but... Which is something I just watched, and it's men. Oh, yes, dude. What a... Yeah, that is exactly right. That's probably exactly what I'm thinking of, too. Michael seems to still kind of be able to use that hand more functionally oh, yeah. than the average human would be able to. Isn't that also the hand that is missing three fingers? Or is that the no, other hand? No, that's the other hand. Oh, my God. So he's got... So well. Yeah. <laughs> At least I'm pretty sure it was the other hand. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. We just watched it ten minutes ago. I don't know. Overall, that feeds into this idea of the violence in this movie is not what I expect mm. from a Halloween movie in general. Because I was going to say, Halloween 1978 is not, like, super crazy in its violence. There's a playfulness to Michael's violence mm. that yes. was really missing in this one. There's really only two sequences of violence. Well, there's the cop getting killed in the sewer, but that's kind of a whole different thing. Right, right. There is the sequence where the doctor that Allison works for and his nurse, a girlfriend who he gave the promotion to, oh. get murked by tag team Michael oh, Myers yes, and dude. Corey. That is cool and satisfying, but the stalking leading up to that sequence is not very engaging. And, yeah, the doctor gets rocked pretty hard. The corpse screw again. Through, but... The only real thing that happens in that sequence is that the nurse gets pinned to the wall, like OG 1978 style, which is classic. That's the Michael Myers classic. Yeah. It's the definitive move is to stick a butcher knife through somebody's chest and just let just it hang leave there, there yeah. which just doesn't make sense. <laughs> never will, no, it no matter, matter how many Halloween movies do uh, it. But I don't really care because Michael Myers is oh, a yeah. magic man. He, if he's strong enough to do all that other stuff, I bet he's strong enough to push a knife into a wall that far, I guess. Sure. And then the other sequence of violence, which is the one that's a little bit more fun, quote-unquote, when the teens that are awful, awful oh, people yes, get the, their stuff... The marching band teams. Annihilated. Oh. By, exclusively by Corey, after he's stolen the Michael yep. Myers mask. Running over the fence girl, oh, and... Jesus, yeah. Drunk, 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 that's probably the most Michael Myers-esque kill to me in this entire movie, because... Michael Myers likes to take things that are kind of emblematic of the yeah. certain character and then twist them in a really awful way. We also do get another, like, weird fake-out headshot moment with the stepdad. Um, I really liked that. That was pretty great, but I'll be honest. Now that I liked the headshot is that I liked the way the camera framed it and it felt very yes. halloween -y. Yes, It felt more Sam Raimi than anything else <laughs> to me. Yeah, I, see, I know what you mean. Corey's stepdad stands up the little stivoli leather jacket yeah. Yeah, that he gave his rifle to shoots, intending to hit Corey standing behind him. He gets the headshot, and then by the time that the stepdad falls back down, Corey's, Corey's gone. gone. Oh, the best. Yeah, that is truly a, a great, great sequence of Michael. Ma and he, you know, Michael's not even there, but it's, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. And the blowtorch to Ooh. that goes through the band kid's face. That felt much more like a Halloween Kills moment to me. But also, in Halloween Kills, they would have showed it. True. I mean, it's it's showing. In this, it's it's out of focus. Yeah, I and guess. it's kind of implied what happens, as opposed to... In Halloween Kills, they would have been like, No, here you go, here it is, it's coming. Yeah. Blow George is coming. I guess my big takeaway is I really wish Michael Myers had done more in this movie. I Because he doesn't do anything. The only thing he even tries to do, really, of his own volition, is kill Lori. And that even seems kind of like an afterthought. Because it almost seems like he goes back to get his mask. That's like the last shot is the mask on the coffee table. That's a cool way to end it. Is They end it very similarly to the way the original ends with him breathing over all of these safe spaces that you associate with just like normal yeah. home life. Stairs, a living room, a street in a nice neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And evil is everywhere. Evil's in the shadows. And then here, birds are chirping. It's calm. 
Or he's going like, to Japan, maybe. Mm-hmm. With the guy who I thought would have more <laughs> Me too. Because he's really a big part of Halloween and Halloween Kills. They set him up to do more in this movie, too. I don't know. I don't know. It's time to talk about the future of the franchise. Michael Myers Jr. So, Corey goes out pretty hard in this movie. So, Laurie shoots him twice, as Seamus has just corrected me <laughs> off there. Yes. I don't want to make it clear. Of course. he's accusing me of editorial bias. So, she makes it clear that she's not going to kill him after he has tried to kill her. In an effort to win posthumously by making Allison believe that Laurie has killed him. He runs his butcher knife through his own throat, is lying there on the floor bleeding until much later when Michael Myers comes in and snaps his neck. Oh, yeah. Girl. But very suspiciously, we never see the body after they crush him. They grind up Michael Myers. We don't hear anything about him. So I almost wonder if they won filmed the scene where he was more definitively dead and then chose not to put it in, or filmed the scene where he more definitively was missing Mm. and And chose not to leave it in. Because I think that's actually a really smart way to play with our expectations of the franchise. They could play it a lot of different ways that I wouldn't necessarily have too many problems with if they wrote it in a more fun way. I mean, they don't even have to explain it too hard. Just do a shot of him opening his eyes, and they look a little weird. I'm like, those are Michael Myers' eyes. I know what's happening here. And then we get into the new franchise. I was going to say, I do not want more, like, Halloween movies, really. But I would love get the malignant people to just do a Corey Corey movie. Corey. (laughs) And it's not in Haddonfield, but... Yeah, I mean, this, this was, was a movie. A, it was a movie indeed. It was an interesting flick. I will I will love to go see Season of the Witch to see if there's some weird hypnotism slash possession stuff going on. Ultimately, this is a movie that if it weren't part of a big franchise or if it weren't the conclusion <clears throat> to a big franchise and you and I just were like, it's October, let's throw on a stupid horror movie and we watch this, I think we'd be super yeah, happy. no that. problem. Exactly. I, I agree. I agree. So, it's fun. It's not as fun as it could be. It's not as violent as it could be, but also, we learn from Halloween Kills, sometimes that's a blessing. Yes, exactly. This is, this is clearly not the worst of these movies. This week's pop culture reference is... Oh, oh my god, it's coming! It's coming over the horizon! Oh, Jesus! Warner warning! Over the last several weeks, the boogeymen at Warner Brothers Discovery have struck again. The Warner Brothers television group laid off 82 scripted, unscripted, and animation employees and will not fill an additional 43 current vacant roles. These 125 positions comprise 26% of the workforce across those divisions. While these layoffs were largely anticipated, there was more bad news regarding Warner Brothers Discovery's animation landscape. Cartoon Network Studios will be merged with Warner Brothers Animation. With Warner Brothers Discovery head David Zaslav focusing efforts almost solely on existing IP, it's unlikely that Cartoon Network will be able to continue its championing of original series and specials. Warner Brothers also announced this week that it will be closing its writers and directors workshops, which are known for giving emerging writers and directors a path into the industry especially women and people of color. Former Warner Brothers workshop talent had worked on or are currently working on the production teams for series like Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Lovecraft Country, and House of the Dragon. Following the Directors Guild of America stepping in and signing the studio's collective bargaining agreement with the guild that legally requires them to have a directing pipeline program, Warner Brothers Discovery stated that they would merely move the initiatives to their diversity unit. However, according to sources inside the existing WBTV workshops, the corporate DE and I teams will be creating entirely different workshop programs without the involvement of existing staff, effectively killing these initiatives as they have always existed. I know that this isn't our traditional Warner Warning news slot over at the beginning of the show, but this was just such a robust amount of information that we felt like we really had to come in and give a bigger reference update where we can go more in-depth about what this means for the overall landscape of Warner Brothers Animation and Cartoon Network, which, as we mentioned, has been such a harbor for this original animation that's been coming out. I mean, as somebody who just finished my autumnal rewatch of Over the Garden Uh, Wall, 
there are a few things nearer and dearer to my heart that I kept thinking as I was watching, even before this news broke, what a miracle it is that it even exists. Because it's a weird, creepy, barely appropriate for kids. That's what it is, too. Miniseries on Cartoon Network that is one of the great Halloween pieces of art. I adore it. It is maybe a perfect piece of media. I feel like if in the, the annals of media history, Over the Garden Wall will be championed in the end as maybe one of the best things ever made. I don't know. I, I love it so much. And the twisted irony is we're more likely to see a continuation of Over the Garden Wall now than we are to see any kind of new property that could be just as moving and effective as that original piece was. In the last couple of years, I have not been super confident with uh, Warner Brothers and the Cartoon Network properties and the HBO Max of it all. And the, This is a major blow. It, it is a shame. I mean, I, you grew up on Cartoon Network. I grew up on Cartoon Network. This is definitely just a sad fizzle for what should have been, like, the most long-standing and high-praised studios of all time, and they're just kind of getting swallowed up, which is really, really sad. Now it's time for Star Noirs, where we break down the latest episode of the Disney Plus original Star Wars series, Andor. This week, we're going to be talking about episode six, The Eye. And Seamus... Oh, boy! What an episode. What an episode... I don't think this joke works with a subscription service, but I paid for my whole seat, but I only used the edge, Garrett. I was right. I was I was tensed up the whole time, man. I didn't know where this heist was going to. Should we just, I mean, we talked about the actors and stuff every week now. It's got to be straight to spoilers. Because straight the spoilers. whole episode is an action sequence, kind of like Mandalorian, but also, alternatively, <laughs> nothing like the Mandalorian. Yeah. All of the characters we've been praising, all of our new characters in this band of, of insurgents are flourishing hard in this in this heist episode. There wasn't a ton of setup for us, the audience, in the, the last couple episodes, like there have been for Andor and all of his new buddies. But seeing it all kind of come to fruition and, and go down the way it does, it's not an Ocean's Eleven. They didn't walk it out entirely for us. We basically got like, there's a ship, we're stealing money, and we're going to make it out with the eye meteor showers. But everything in this episode, in between where they wake up and where they end up at the end, it was a roller coaster. It was crazy. I loved it. They don't just jump right into action, action at the beginning of this. They really do ratchet it up slowly. And there's always something going on. There's very little dialogue, to be honest, in this episode. Mm. Honestly, I think it can almost work silently. Overall, it's just building tension and telling a story visually. And I think this is the best the action has looked on this show so far. But oh, yeah. The only action that's really been on this show so far, because it's spurts of violence, mostly, that we get on the show. People shooting blindly at Cassian and or telling like, Skarsgård. Cassian being shot from, like, the torso up and then, like, a blaster bolt in, in out of frame somewhere. He shoots a guy in the back in the rain or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very spy. Like, there aren't, like, major scale battles. We learn that Tamarin, and I've got all the names up. Oh, thank God. I don't. We're going to have to be able to keep track of him. And he's the guy that's been leading their little platoon of yes. fake Imperial guys. And he's got the mustache, the very handsome mustache. Oh, yeah. We learned that he was a stormtrooper, which I thought was a really interesting thing to sprinkle in, because all throughout this series we've been kind of accruing, in just the last couple episodes, the motivations for all mm -hmm. these people and why they joined the Rebellion, and we didn't really know why Terran was a part of this movement, and the implication that comes with him having been a stormtrooper, I think, is really interesting. I like seeing more Imperial defectors, and I like how varied they all are. Oh, yeah. Because he feels nothing like Bodhi from Rogue One, but it also immediately makes me think about Cassian's relationship with Bodhi and how that's informing his character, and it makes me want to rewatch Rogue One. Oh, like, dude, every week I want to rewatch re Rogue One, pretty much. And I think uh, he's one of the less interesting characters in the group because just he's frankly the least mm. developed. 
and you've got Vel and Cinta that are off on their little side quest, hiding in the rocks before they dive under yeah. the dam, and that's really cool. And oh yeah, what, like the view of them swimming or diving with their propellers and then up, seeing the first bits of the eye start to come through. Very interesting, at least visually. My favorite shot of the whole episode was when they finally regroup with the Imperial Infiltration team, they jump down that ladder, and the camera pushes towards them, and Sins is like, got the gun out, oh, yeah. moving back and forth, and the lens flares like it's a J.J. Abrams <laughs> movie, and, but not one of the Star Wars movies for some right, reason, because right. I know lens flares in those for some reason. That's a really effective entrance for those characters, yeah. and it makes you feel how intimidated the Imperial officers probably are Ooh, yeah. as they realize that this is a coordinated attack and not just some guys that stole Imperial uniforms. I thought the heist itself was so interesting. There's, like, the governor guy who's trying to get his family off-world, and he's a piece of garbage, and he, mm -hmm. you know, gets really thrown around, which is fun. And we, we get our, like kind of side character radio tech guy in the tower who's like one of the only competent Imperials on the base apparently. I know they're Imperial guys but I do feel kind of bad that the guys don't get to watch the eye. I mean they don't deserve to because they're colonizing pieces of crap that are Yeah they're like laughing about how like these are the last time these native idiots are going to get to see it from this angle or whatever I mean in the escape sequence watching like the Imperials and the native people Side by side, everyone is mesmerized by the wonder of the galaxy. People are crying. Imperials are being jerks to people, whatever. It, that was actually, like, very powerful and sweet. Mm -hmm. It humanizes these Imperial infantry guys, which love seeing that armor again. I always a treat seeing that. It really humanizes them in a way that, like, the that governor guy who has a heart attack later on <laughs> does not get humanized at all. And I love how that is so directly referencing Cassian's line from a few episodes ago where he's like, the Empire is so fat and complacent, <laughs> yeah. they're just never going to think that we would ever Ooh. steal from them, which also is echoed in Karis's, who's our little friend, who's the commie guy. Oh, yes! Uh, he has that line last episode where uh, an attack from above is never as surprising as one from, one from below. below. yeah. I mean, I, I guess the, that big card of gold attack I was going to say, he, good. he didn't see the attack of getting his spine severed in that spaceship. I knew he wasn't going to really make it out unscathed, but it was such a weirdly real way to end this man's life in the show. I think there's a couple of things that can be gleaned from that thematically. One is the more lofty, it's really a shame that it's not even the acts of war mm. or the intentionality of killing that take away this bright star in the rebellion's life, that it's just an accident. It's a pure, yeah. awful accident. There's also something to be said for the fact that the kid who's all, there's no ethical consumption under the Empire, is literally crushed by I, tons of gold oh, that they just stole from the Empire like, and are attempting to redistribute to the masses. It's stamped with the Imperial insignia, just crushes in between two piles of it. It's, it's brutal. The only people that make it out of the heist are Cassian, Karis, Asterisk, because he's, you know, got his spine crushed by right, gold. Right. Vel, who we still don't know what her relationship to Luthen is. They haven't expanded on that anymore. They don't necessarily need to. I'm just curious because mm. they seem to kind of set up that they yeah. would. And the guy we haven't mentioned yet who, you know, you were excited to see what happened with him. And boy, did that pay off is Arvel, the prison guy. Yeah, oh man. I don't mean not to mention Skeen. They all call him Skeen. Right, right. I was going to say the other lady is still on the planet in yeah. disguise. They kind of have like a whole like be safe you're, like, being left behind here, don't mess it up kind of thing. So you bet your ass she's getting captured and tortured by my baby boy who's missing from this damn episode, my boy Karn. I know, but what the hell? in an episode this good, I it's know, okay. I'll I let know. them have it. Karn's going to come in. It's going to be punished Karn. He's going to be like, I know you know where they are, and he's going he's gonna to go off. But until then, I, I, I thought this episode was absolutely what about fantastic. punished Cassian after he killed? Killed Skeen. Oh, I was, I really wasn't sure how that conversation was going to go down. Because it's like, well, I guess he is a mercenary. And I guess he is here for the money. This guy kind of gave him the out a couple times in terms of, like, putting the knife to his neck and cooling off about it. Or 
bonding about their pri- their mutual prison experiences, but Cassian ices this man hard. I was not expecting that no, at all. Because not at all. At first I was really surprised. I was like, that's out of character because he's not involved in the rebellion enough yet until you think about the fact that it's really self-preservation because if Skeen knows that Cassian knows that he's planning to abscond mm-hmm. with riches, Cassian's a loose end if he won't go oh, with yeah. him. So... That's Cassian fighting for his own life, and then it's his word against a dead man Pretty right much. now. Yeah, it, it's revealed that Skeen is like, not only will he fully betray the entire rebellion, get off with the money, live comfortably for the rest of his life, but everything he'd even tried to open up about beforehand, he has no brother. That sucks. I was totally on board with this guy and his brother. You're right, self-preservation, it is self-defense in a way. It's like, this guy's going to betray the entire rebellion and his fake dead brother. Of course he's going to shoot me in the back the second I turn away from him. So, not only did he not have a choice, but I think that interaction with Bell in the surgeon's office there, and his, like, very desperate attitude of, like, I came here for a job, I'm not trying to take more than I'm worth, I'm not trying to screw you, I had to do this, you know, I'm already in this mess deeper than I need to be. That's going to get through Vel back to old Luthen, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to kind of be the tether that brings them all back together a little bit to show that maybe he's a little more unorthodox, but he's not going to fully betray everything in the universe for himself like like the other guy was. A man's got to have a code. A man's got to have a code. And... That Luthen's going to have a great laugh at the end of that episode. That is such a great way to end this episode. That that laugh to the black out of just, like, the success of it all. I also feel like it might be as intimate as hearing the words rebel or, like, rebel attack and be like, oh, it's not just, like, random terrorist attack or incident that the Empire can write off in the news as, like, a mining accident. It's, like, rebel attack, successful Heist achieved. He's he's in it, and I think once we get to episode seven this next mm-hmm. week, I think it, it's got to have Val and him together, kind of mixing the pot a little bit, figuring out those mysteries that we still have between them too. This is one of the most compelling hours of the franchise. Yes, as a whole. best episode of this show by far. Best, best episode, episode of, of Star Wars. Any of show. Yeah. I'm <laughs> counting Rebels. I'm counting yeah, Clone Wars. Dude. Everything about it. But yeah, Star Wars. I'm ready for Star episode Wars, seven. baby. I'm. Well, I can't wait for next week. We are officially halfway through now. That was our That's big right. yeah. event of oh, the season. Hell of a midpoint. <laughs> Now it's time to save the rec center, where we bring you our weekly recommendations. Seamus, you're up first. I'm back to the old video game train, Garrett. And I, this one is specifically a bit in anticipation for the new God of War. I am in the thick of God of War 2, the original sequel to the franchise, and it is... Honestly, a blast. I know we've talked before. I, I, I almost guarantee I rep-centered the first God of War when I was playing it. And I know you're not a hack-and-slash style person, but there's something about this PS Plus Classics catalog when you play a game that just isn't the most open-ended thing that was ever created. And you can just advance in a game and get to a save point or a checkpoint that it's like, I'm doing something. <laughs> I don't have to go back to the Mist Echoes area of God of War 2018 and grind for 10 years. I don't have to backtrack through however many areas to rip apart however many numbers of bad guys. I'm going to defend God of War 2018's <laughs> honor for a second and say <laughs> okay, that hey, they hey. do a lot of work to make sure you do not have to backtrack, <laughs> yeah. except for with the Mist Echoes, which is an entirely, it's a different game. I it's know, a mini I game. Know. But uh, I'm saying in terms of, like, I've played Days Gone recently, I've played Yakuza recently, I've played all these open world, a million collectibles, a million things to do, and it, it's just really satisfying to have a game that is written to be played from point A to point B, and you can feel the progress through a story that is entirely compelling and weird. I I mean, the spoiler's a little bit for a 20-year-old game, but I just had a fight with uh, Perseus, which was, a, which was a lot of fun. You know, they just sprinkle that stuff in there that, that, that makes it very interesting, and I'm sure there's going to be more references in the new God of War for the older games. So, 
if you have the chance, Garrett, I know you don't, and I know you will never have the chance, more or less, you should definitely play them. Give the hack and slash another shot. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. You, get, you feel so god of war about it all. You're killing so many people. But what do you have for the rec center this week, Garrett? Well, we already talked about it up at the top of the show, but I've got to give a local shout-out. I've got to give it to honor my boy, Mike Shank. Please yes. go watch American Movie. It is the funniest documentary ever made. Yes, agreed. It is just such a nice slice of life pleasure to get to watch all of these people that are involved in making the movie, that are family and friends to the people that are involved in making the movie, just inhabit this very specific time in this very specific place, and of course, you and I, being University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee alumni, we really have to give a big old shout out to how prominently it features the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The main people are University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee attendees. The people who created Mm. the documentary are classmates of theirs. There's a lot of stuff going on there, and it's just a wonderful time. And now that it's going to be on Blu-ray, get your local libraries to purchase that. If you've seen the film and you like it, go ahead and purchase it. I know I will be purchasing it. Absolutely, me too. That is a movie that I hold very close to me. I did nearly have a breakdown the first time I watched it, and being a very new UWM, I hadn't started yet. I just applied and got accepted, and then my mom was like, hey, I heard about this movie. It takes place, it's all about UWM. And I got through half of it, and I was like, this is my destiny. This is what my life will be one day. Watching it now, it gives me nothing but the biggest smile on my face. It is so endearing and absolutely hilarious and full of some of the most genuine people I've ever seen in a documentary space, and I second that recommendation from you. That wraps us up for this week's episode of Pop Culture Reference. Pop Culture Reference ends! <laughs> oh, God. If you want to reach the show, you can find us at PCR underscore podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. You can email us personally at popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. Whatever platform you're listening on, please give us a like, subscribe, comment, engage in any way you can. It really helps the show out. And, of course... Next week, the power hierarchy of the Michael oh, Myers team oh, 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 is oh, about to oh, change oh. with Black <laughs> Adam. I'm looking forward to it. It's crazy that I'm so dreading it, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's weird. I'm, I'm in a Morbid state, if I'm being honest. I feel like it's a Morbius level event in, in a way. It was just like, makes no real sense. Nobody really knows the character that well. We talk about Black Adam. Adios, 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 adios.